Hello and welcome to the second lecture for topic six and in this lecture we're going to talk about theories of representation. Okay so as we know we live in a republic and a republic means that we have a representative form of democracy and so in a representative form of democracy um, the people who live in that democracy are not the ones who are going directly to make decisions about what kind of laws and policies we're going to have, but we elect somebody to do that bidding for us, to represent us. And so since we live in a representative form of democracy, that we have representatives that claim to act or speak on the behalf of the people, on behalf of the voters. The question is, is for the representative democracy to work, we need to trust that the representatives actually do speak for us. And so how do we build or create this trust? How can we build this um, sense that when the representative is um, acting, that they're actually acting on behalf of the will of the people, what the people want, and not just representing what they want. And so we're going to take a look at two theories that give us an idea of how this trust is built between the people and the representative. Your textbook offers two theories for to help us understand how that trust is built between the constituent and their representative. And the two theories that your textbook offers are agency theory of representation and sociological theory of representation. So let's take a look at these theories in more detail. So let's start with agency theory of representation. From this perspective, it says that we trust our rep representatives to act on our behalf because we're actually formally bound together. In other words, they sort of see the relationship between the constituent and the representative as an agent-client relationship. Um, and so the example that they use in the textbook is um, a, a client and their lawyer. So if you're accused of a crime and you want to get good defense, you hire a lawyer to represent your interests, right? To like try to make sure that you don't end up um, you know, uh, convicted of the crime. And so you're formally bound. They act on your behalf. Now, I mean, obviously, since representatives represent so many people in their district that they aren't and don't have as close of a relationship as you have with an attorney-client relationship. Um, however, it is sort of similar that we elect these people and we expect them to represent what we want. And then if they don't represent our will, then we're going to like fire them. In other words, we're not going to vote for them again. And so we elect the representatives and we expect them to seek out the interests of the of their constituency and to take those interests into account when governing. So we want to feel like the representative is listening to us. What are our concerns? And then we see those concerns translated into governmental action. And if and if we feel if the constituents feel that they that they are not being um, that their interests are not being represented by the person that they elected, then in theory, we hold those people accountable and we don't vote for them in the next election. And so agency theory of representation sort of sees representation as this formal bond, bond um, between agent and client and that they do their job. And if they're not doing their job in terms of representing what the constituents want, then they don't vote for them in the next election. So how do representatives build that trust um, with their constituency? How do they build this trust and this relationship so that, that they feel that they communicate to their constituents, that they're listening to them and they're acting on their behalf? Well, there's lots of ways that lawmakers do that, representatives do that. Uh, one is that they tend to have open lines of communications with the people in their district. And so um, they do that in many ways. Some representatives will have town hall meetings, um, you know, once or twice a year and, uh, it, you know, throughout the different areas within their district. And they'll you know, meet at a library and say, hey, come, tell me what your concerns are. And then you listen to those concerns. Um, they also have websites um, that are basically information about what they're doing. You can go to their website. You can see what they're working on. And there's usually areas where you can give feedback and, um, you know, say, hey, this is what I'm interested in, work on this, et cetera. Um, and, you know, back in the day, you used to get um, mailings and sometimes you still do get like actual mailings from your members of Congress that are telling them what they're doing to help the district and to represent the district. Um, even more specifically, that, that your textbook talks about this thing called constituent casework. And so um, throughout the uh, members district, they'll have offices throughout the district and they have lots of staff that um, you know, work in those offices. And people can call those offices if they have a problem um, uh, that they can ask for some assistance. So let's say 
you are expecting your social security check and it never comes you can call your um your representative's local office and somebody who works in that office will try to help solve the problem with for you if you're having trouble like recently with um, during the pandemic small businesses could fill out applications for loans to help out their business that might have been harmed during the pandemic if you're having trouble with that you can call your representative's office and you know so even though we might think that people our representatives are really just like lazy or not hardworking or just like living off the taxpayer dollars it's you know that's actually not the truth that they have a whole field of people that work for them that they um that really are trying to solve the, the problems of the of the people that live in their district and then um your textbook talks about that since our lawmakers have like more power and more resources just by virtue of being a lawmaker that oftentimes they um, try to directly help their constituents through this thing called patronage and a really good example of that is pork belt barrel legislation and what pork barrel legislation is is that when congress is spending money um members of congress will put earmarks in the budget bill in order to bring money back for a, a specific local project that needs funding. Uh, I went to graduate school in, um, in, uh, uh, at Purdue University, and that's in West Lafayette, Indiana. And the long-term representative that lived in, uh, or that represented the area around Purdue University, uh, his name was John Myers, and he was in office for a really long time. And part of the reason why he was in office for so long is he brought a lot of funding back to the local project, uh, the local district. Uh, we had railroads that like went right through the town. And it was kind of cool because there was this bar called the Knickerbocker, and there was an actual train car that came right down the middle of the street. It was like a, like it was like a business district. And it went right by the bar and uh, sometimes graduate students would drink in the Knickerbocker and a train would come by and then they would run out and try to jump on the train and be like a hobo for 30 seconds. Um, but as I got, I never did that. No, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Uh, but, you know, as I left graduate school, um, John Myers, the representative, he brought back a lot of money to the district to relocate those railroad tracks around, around the outside of town rather than going through the middle of town because people were, even though it was kind of fun to jump on a train, it was really irritating trying to get to work or campus because the trains would go right through the city. So that's a really good example of pork barrel legislation. It didn't really matter if you were a Democrat or Republican, but you kept voting for this person because they brought back money to the district to actually solve um, problems. So these are good examples of how um, uh, representatives really try to build that um, relationship between the people that they are representing. So how do representatives measure up? Um, do they listen to the, the needs and the concerns of their constituents? Well, you know, it's kind of hard to tell uh, that, you know, for one, many people who live in a district, they might not even know who their representative is. They don't pay attention to the vast majority of things that are going on within their district. They may never contact their representative. They may never attend a town hall meeting. And so that, you know, uh, you know, that while the representative might try to reach out and have town hall meetings and those sorts of things, vast majority of people are not attending those. So um, it's kind of hard to figure out whether or not the representative is actually responding to the vast majority of people that live in their um, congressional district. It's also hard to tell because representatives are, they listen to their constituents, but they also listen to other people or other entities as well. Um, representatives get a lot of pressure from their party leadership to vote a certain way. And so they might vote with an eye to party, what the party wants rather than what their constituents want. Um, there's also pressure from interest groups. And so uh, certain special interest groups um, might be pressuring a lawmaker to vote this way or that way. And if they don't vote that way, they may not get contributions to um, their reelection campaign. And so while they may take the interests of their constituents into into to mind when they're making decisions, it's not the only um, uh, 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 things that they're taking into consideration when they're making decisions. Often, uh, Congress, um, you know, oftentimes fails to act. You know, I mean, when you look at the, your textbook talks about how within the last, you know, 15 or 20 years, uh, you know, many sessions of Congress are really, they don't pass a lot of laws. They don't get a lot done. And even though people really want Congress to act and take action to solve problems that are facing our nation, Congress sort of fails to act. And a lot of times that's because 
Congress, um, it's growing, it's grown to be more polarized. Your textbook talks about that. And that polarization makes it harder for parties to compromise. Um, and so if you're not willing to compromise, it's pretty hard to get stuff done. However, um, you know, whether or not the, um, uh, the representative is listening to the people that live in their, cons in, in their district, or um, I mean, obviously, even if they don't get things done, uh, your textbook talks that about how failure to compromise, failure to get things done, failure to, you know, to listen not just to their constituency, but to their party leadership and to interest groups, it doesn't seem to cost representatives their job. Because representatives, as you know from reading the chapter, have a really high rate of re-election. Uh, if you, you know, in, in the House, you have a re-election rate of almost, you know, over 90%. Uh, and so that might also indicate, well, it's kind of hard to measure are, you know, are representatives really listening to what their constituents want? If you look at their rate of reelection, it's relatively high. Um, uh, uh, but it, it is the reason that people are voting for them because they're satisfied with the job that they're doing, or is it just name recognition, or there's just not a lot of people come to vote uh, for congressional elections, which is oftentimes the case. Okay, so let's take a look at the second theory, which is the sociological theory of representation. And from this theory's perspective, we trust our representatives to act on our behalf, not just because we're formally bound with them, but because we share a similar, that we share similar sociological features. And that when the sociological features of the representatives is very similar to those of their constituents, then those representatives can do a better job representing their constituents. And so when we talk about sociological um, features, we're talking about that there should be, when we look at the people representing us, that there should be similarity in terms of gender of the broader population, similarity in terms of race, religion, age, class, ideology. In other words, that those who are representing us are gonna do a better job representing us if they are like us. And so, and why is that? Well, the thinking is, is that people who share similar sociological features have uh, the same or similar lived experience. Uh, in other words, if you are, uh, 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 if you are um, uh, middle class or lower class, uh, that, and you, you grew up in, in more poor circumstances, then you understand what it's like if, if you are, a, 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 what it's like to live in poverty or to live with economic constraints. And so that if our law, if you are representing a district that is mostly um, middle to lower class, that under, from this perspective, you might not trust that a billionaire or somebody with a lot of money could actually represent that district um, because they don't understand what it's like to live in, uh, in a more constrained economic environment. Um, if the district is predominantly a minorities, uh, that minorities might not feel that they could be best represented by a white representative. Uh, why? They might feel that what the lived experience of a minority within uh, the United States is really different than the lived experience of a white person. And that they might just say that they, that they just feel like they don't know what it's like to be a minority in America and it, it, unless you are a minority in America. And so you might feel like that your representative is more able to represent your interests if you share certain the similar sociological uh, uh, features. So from this perspective, we have trust in our representatives because they are sociolo sociologically like us. As such, the closer the sociological makeup of the legis that the, le the the closer the sociological makeup of the legislature is to the general population, the more trust we have that the legislature can properly represent the will of the people. So, what is the sociological makeup of Congress, and how closely does it align with the sociological makeup of the general population in the United States? Well, let's take a look at some graphs and see. Okay, so let's take a look at this sl slide, and it is a graph that's from your textbook. And let me put my magic pen on, and we'll talk about how to read this graph. And so this is the key up here. And when you look at this part here, that shows the biggest part of the rainbow is the U.S. population. Um, and so when you're looking on the outside here, okay, that's what the, the, the sociological makeup of the United States population is as it relates to party or religion or race. 
the middle part of the rainbow is the sociological makeup of the house of representatives it's bigger so it's like has a bigger rainbow and then the middle one there that's the sociological makeup of the senate so let's see how things compare all right well so when it comes to gender gender is uh blue is male red is female or pink is female because pink is for girls and blue is for boys um and uh you know it's about 50 50. the population is about 50 percent 51 percent women uh 49 percent men oh check it out <laughs> the sociological makeup of the house and the senate don't really match up to the sociological makeup when it comes to gender in the general population uh about 27 percent of congress is female and the remaining 73 percent is male so pretty big gen gender gap there um how a party well you know here we see a difference as well and it kind of relates to what we were talking about earlier about the house of representatives um that a little a little less than a third of people in the united states identify as republican more as democrats and you know uh, more than a third of uh, 34 percent uh identify as as is independent but as we know whoop, when we look at party representation it doesn't really match up with the sociological breakdown um race uh is uh there's less of a race gap but there's still a gap there and so 60 percent of the united states population is white um but 77 percent of the senate is white so pretty big gap there have somewhat of a gap with religion uh that um when it comes to protestant that's red pretty equal when it comes to catholic uh pretty equal um but that the big missing piece is um like others people who i don't identify as protestant catholic jewish or mormon and so that um you know when it comes to religion uh that uh those without a uh a non-denominational and those who don't affiliate with the religion are underrepresented that uh, sociologically in Congress. Class isn't shown on the graph, so I thought I'd just include that in terms of economic class. Um, in the United States, between five and seven percent of households are worth more than a million dollars. Not surprising, Congress, uh, over 50 percent of members of Congress are worth more than a million dollars and some significantly more than a million dollars. And this is just another way of looking at religion. In the United States, 71 percent of uh, Americans identify as being Christian. And this is from uh, the Pew research uh, that they do uh, um, every few years on looking at the religious landscape in the United States. Um, so 71% of Americans identify as Christian, 88% of members of Congress uh, represent uh, that uh, identify as Christian. And here's that difference that I was saying here. It's that nearly a quarter of Americans identify as not being affiliated with a religious group, but 0.2% of members of Congress are unaffiliated. So kind of have a sociological gap there. So while the sociological makeup of Congress is starting to look more and more like the general population of the United States, um, there's still a ways to go. So while there have been advances made in the diversity of Congress, we've still got some ground to make up. As I mentioned, 77% of Congress is white, while only 60% of the United States population is white, so that's a pretty significant gap. 51% of the U.S. population is women, and only 27 members of Congress are women, although that's the highest percentage of women we've had in Congress in the history of the United States. Um, and openly LGBTQ representatives will make up about 2% of the House and 2% of the Senate, while they make up about 5.6% in the general population. Um, Wisconsin has two openly uh, gay members, uh, the Representative Mark Pocan and Senator Tammy Baldwin. And currently there are no transgender members of Congress. Just some information there as we were talking about the sociological makeup. And here is just a graph to show, show you the, the improvements that have been made in terms of the number of women in Congress. And so we see that women since 1980 have increased um, and it's increased even more. This is from 2017. So when we talk about 2020 and 21, the gap is closing even more. Um, but they say that it, if we keep continuing at this rate, it'll take about 90 years before we have gender parity in Congress. And here's a graph that you can take a look at that basically shows the um, increases in uh, uh, racial and ethnic diversity in Congress uh, and the improvements from 2001 until where we are today. 
uh, again, closing that uh, racial gap and um, in, uh, in increasing the amount of sociological diversity as it relates to race and ethnicity so that the United States Congress is beginning to look sociologically more like the general population. Okay, so now we, get a, we have an idea of what Congress looks like in terms of sociological um, features and comparing that to the general population and we see that there are some gaps there. But the question we need to ask is, well, does it matter that Congress looks like the general population? Um, does it matter that the sociological features of Congress are very similar to the sociological features of the general population? Um, some say, yes, it matters. And we're gonna take a look at two reasons um, for that. Some say that sociological um, representation um, matters because of some for symbolic importance. And others say that there's real legislative differences in terms of the way that um, women and minorities, when they're in Congress, they actually legislate in a different way and in a different way that might be beneficial to the broader population. So let's take a look at these two reasons. So let's start with the, with the first reason, which is that there is a symbolic importance to a sociologically representative Congress. Um, the thinking along these lines is that if you look at Congress and Congress doesn't look like the body it's representing, it can reinforce feelings of lack of trust and diminished political efficacy. Remember earlier in the semester, we talked about that people really feel like their voices aren't being heard, that the people that are representing them are, are not, don't really, that they're not like us, that they don't understand our problems, that, um, that you feel like your voice isn't being heard. Um, and so we have high levels of lack of trust and high levels of um, feeling like you don't have political efficacy in the United States. And some say that's because um, Congress doesn't really look like America. But when Congress looks more like the people it's representing, that this can lead to an increase in tr trust and efficacy. Let me give you two pictures, show you two pictures that um, maybe bring this, the symbolic importance um, to um, sort of bring it to life. So let's take a look at these two pictures. Okay, so um, you might um, be familiar with a, um, a uh, federal law called the Affordable Care Act, right? And the afford also known as Obamacare, right? And so while President Obama was the president of the United States, uh, Congress passed and the President Obama signed into law uh, the Affordable Care Act. And one of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act is that if you have health insurance, there are a, a certain essential health benefits that are covered by your insurance. In other words, you can't be you can't be made to if you have insurance, you can't be made to pay more for certain essential health benefits. And um, for women, some of those essential health benefits are um, maternity care, newborn coverage, contraceptive care, okay? And so that if you have insurance and you pay your insurance, you can't be made to pay more for contraceptives or more for um, maternity care. It's kind of like covered in your insurance just by virtue of having insurance. Well, during the Trump administration, they um, debated changing uh, what is included in the essential health care benefits. Uh, that is maybe um, making it so that insurance doesn't have to cover newborn care or doesn't have to cover maternity care or doesn't have to cover contraceptives. And this is a picture. It says there, Vice President Pence tweeted this picture um, and it got a lot of heat. And what the picture is, is it's a picture of the Freedom Caucus, the Republican Freedom Caucus. That's sort of like a, a wing within the Republican Party. Uh, and that they were coming together to discuss ending the essential health benefit coverage in the Affordable Care Act. And that you look at everybody who's around that table sort of saying, hey, let's get rid of maternity care and get rid of contraceptive coverage from our insurance. It's a whole bunch of men, right? Now, if you're a woman and you're looking at that picture and you're thinking, you know what? Maybe they're willing to get rid of those essential health care benefits because that they're not a woman. They don't know what it's like to, you know, ha need care for maternity or need um, contraceptive coverage, right? That maybe a woman's lived experience in terms of reproduction is different than the lived experience of, of men. And so you look at that and you're like, here, here's a bunch of guys sitting around a table making decisions about my life as a woman. 
and you might say, boy, they, they don't really, they're not really representing me. They don't really understand what it's like, right? And so that, um, you know, uh, not that men can't be concerned about maternal care or cover, um, uh, contraceptive coverage, and many men within the Democratic Party are supportive of this, but symbolically it just doesn't look right. You know, you look at that and you're like, here's a bunch of men making decisions about women's health care. Symbolically, uh, that is making me lose trust in government. What, from this perspective, that's what they would assert. Uh, here's another picture that I think helps bring to light the symbolic importance of diversity within Congress. And in this case, it's diversity within the, um, within the executive branch, within the presidency. Until President Obama, that none of the presidents of the United States had ever been a person of color. They've all, they were all white and, we've, and, and, and they've all been men. We've never had, as you all, all are well aware, we've never had a, a, a female or a woman president, okay? And um, you know, some said that when Obama became president of the United States, it really played the symbolic importance for um, for Americans in general. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, that we finally have a, a, a president, uh, an African American president in office, um, and then also for young black kids uh, and families, it, it could play a particular have a particular significance, just as it would have played if we had a woman president for young girls, sort of like aspiring to the greatest office of the land. Now, this is a picture of a family, um, uh, the Phil Philadelphia family. That's their last name. And in, in American government, there's this tradition that if you work in the White House, um, at, that when you, it's your last day, when you decide that you're not going to work there anymore, that you get to bring your family to the Oval Office and you get to meet with the President of the United States. This wasn't unique to the, pre the President Obama. Many presidents do this. And so um, uh, this, uh, the, the Carl, Carlton Philadelphia was the person, the man who was working at the White House, and this was his last day of work. And he brought his family in, and um, at the at they were meeting the president and shaking hands. And at the end of the meeting, uh, President Obama said to the family, and specifically to the boys, they said, um, "Do you have any questions for me? Is there anything you'd like to ask me?" And Jacob Philadelphia nodded his head yes he said he had a question for the president um and that uh that he looked at his dad and he said is it okay if i ask it and the president said go ahead and ask it and what uh jacob philadelphia said is uh, that he, the question was is he wondered whether or not president obama's hair felt like his hair and president obama bends down and he says well why don't you go ahead and touch it for yourself and so jacob touched his hair and he said yep your hair feels just like mine and so that's like a, a good example of how the sociological features of the people who represented us matter from a symbolic perspective. Um, the other reason that is offered about sociological representation and why it matters is because there are legislative differences. And so that when you have a more diverse Congress it, um, and perhaps a more diverse executive branch, it, it, it governs in different ways. And so from this perspective, they say that, um, or for this point of, uh, of argument, they say that the sociological representation matters uh, because there are, there are real differences in terms of the way women and minorities serve as lawmakers. And this is supported by social science research. Um, women and minority lawmakers more, are more likely to support and introduce legislation that impacts women and minorities. And so if you have a diverse um, uh, general population, uh, that uh, is has you know filled with many women and filled with many minorities. Having more women and minority lawmakers is going to serve the needs of those constituents better. Um, women as lawmakers are more likely to introduce bills and get th bills um, through. Uh, they are more likely to build consensus and get co-sponsorship. Uh, and women are uh, lawmakers are more likely to bring money back to their district. Now there are a lot of reasons for why that that is, but the reality is is women seem to be more effective lawmakers, um, and so that's one legislative important reason that um, that to take into consideration. So um, if you are interested in the sociological representation theory and you're wanting for the Congress to like sociologically be more representative, look more like the sociological features of the US population, how might we go about achieving that? Uh, well, here we're gonna look at a, a couple of suggestions for a closing the gap. 
Um, some, now some countries use uh, achieve parity by using racial and gender quotas. You could also achieve that parity by having, um, you know, income quotas as well, you know. Now, you can achieve parity that way, but that's not likely to happen in the United States. The United States, the, 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 the chance of using quotas, it just would not be accepted. It would rub against sort of our uh, general sense, uh, some of our general values re, uh, regarding equal protection of the law and treating everybody equally and having quotas probably would not not, you know, get any traction in the United States. However, there are different ways that you can close the gap, um, uh, uh, that close uh, some of these sociological gaps. Uh, one is that parties need to create farm teams. So I'm watching baseball, you know, and Brewers are breaking my heart right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, as you know, baseball teams have farm teams. And so they have minor leagues where they draft good players and then they keep them in the minor leagues and then they cook them up and get them real good. And then they bring them on to the, you know, into the, into the, the show, so to speak. Well, um, political parties can do the same thing. And so that if you want to create a more diverse and representative Congress, um, you know, tap women and minority candidates, uh, tap candidates that are of lower income groups or middle income groups um, and give them the money and the resources and the training and the mentoring that they need in order to run for office. And so if you parties create farm teams, then they can have, you know, groups of candidates that they run for lower office and then, you know, in the state legislature and then they get their footing and then they run for you know, the House and the Senate, et cetera. So that's one way of, um, uh, of diversifying Congress. Um, you can also increase public financing of elections. Right now, a lot of people spend a lot of their own money on running for office, and that basically, when somebody's thinking about running for office and they don't have a lot of financial resources, they might say, forget about it. I mean, like, I don't wanna be trolling for dollars all the time, and um, I don't have my own personal finances to do that. And that's what explains that, like, so many millionaires that are representing us in Congress. So if we increase public financing, that is where we would use some of our tax dollars to create a pool and then candidates could pull upon that pool in order to um, finance their campaigns. That would be a way of leveling the economic um, gap. Uh, ranked choice voting uh, and uh, it, you know, it's basically that when you vote for uh, uh, candidates, rather than the just sit, selecting one candidate, you can say, you know, my top candidate is this candidate, but if that candidate do doesn't win, then go to my second candidate. And if my candidate doesn't win, go to my third um, candidate. A lot of times people uh, don't wanna vote for third party candidates, or they don't wanna vote for women, or they don't wanna vote for a minority candidate. Um, or like a transgender candidate, you know, they might think they're the best candidate, but they might think just given some of the biases that we have in our nation in our, or in our district or in our state, there's no way that they're gonna win. So if you used ranked choice voting, you could say, I'm gonna go with my first candidate, but I'm not throwing away my vote. If my first candidate doesn't get that, um, that enough votes to move on, then go to my second candidate. And this can kind of address the electability question that can sometimes uh, be a, a serve as sort of a stop in terms of getting um, electing more diverse candidates. You could institute uh, term limits because as your textbook talks about, part of the reason why we have this lack of diversity is that you know people can enter into office in the 1980s and the 90s. Um, and where that you know where uh, there were different attitudes about race and gender at that time period, and then they could stay in office for 20, 30 years. If you instituted term limits, new seats would open up. Uh, that means you could only serve for 10 years or only 12 years, and then that seat would open up, and that would give an opportunity for new people to run for office. Uh, that would also make it sociologically representative in terms of age as well. We would have to, um, it would reduce that incumbent advantage, but to do that, we would have to amend our constitution and that might be really difficult to do, at least amending it for the national legislature for the United States Congress. All right, thanks a lot for listening. I know there's a lot of material for this, um, for Congress, but there's just a lot of material in the textbook and I just wanted to make sure you had lectures to help you walk you through some of that material. Thanks for listening, bye.